the digital euro is on the move. Yesterday, the Governing Council of the ECB approved the opening of the preparation phase. In case that didn't make it clear enough, the ECB is about to begin the next stage of its CBDC rollout. And those in the know are aware that this could mean the end of financial freedom in Europe. Besides making memes to that effect, informed ex-users have also been fact-checking Christine Lagarde's claims about the digital euro using community notes. It's safe to say that the pushback has begun. Today, we're going to give you an update about what's been going on with the digital euro, explain what its next phase entails, reveal when it could be launched, and explore how you can protect yourself. My name is Guy, and you are watching The Coin Bureau. I'll start by saying that we've been keeping close tabs on digital euro development over the last year or so. To recap, the European Central Bank, or ECB, released a working paper in August last year that detailed the economics of a central bank digital currency, or CBDC. If you watched our video summarizing that paper, you'll know that it implied that cash would be phased out, and even implied that CBDCs would phase out stores of value like gold. You'll also know that it specified that CBDCs could be used to address, quote, moral hazards, foreshadowing total control. Seriously, give that video a watch when you get a chance. It's damning in every sense of the word. Now, back in January, the ECB released its second progress report about its CBDC development. If you watched our video summarizing it, you'll know that the first progress report was published in September 2022, but it apparently wasn't publicized. So, naturally, we dug it up and summarized what it said too. Not surprisingly, the first progress report contained some similarly concerning claims, namely that there would be limits on how much digital euro you can hold, that there would be control of your digital euro transactions, and that privacy would not be possible. This didn't go over well with informed audiences. Lo and behold, the second progress report contained a pivot. Instead of the ECB handling everything, it would only handle the issuance and settlement of the digital euro. In turn, the private sector would do everything else, such as handling customer data. This was a total 180 compared to the working paper. Then, in May this year, the ECB published its third progress report. Naturally, we summarized that too, and if you saw that video, you'll know that by that point, the ECB was having a PR crisis when it came to the digital euro. That's because Christine had been caught on camera admitting that it would be used for financial control. This is probably why the third progress report changed programmability to conditional payments. Now, for context, programmability is what makes it possible to set limits on what you can buy, where you can buy it, and when you can buy it using a digital euro. Obviously, programmability was very controversial. So, in a blatant attempt to try and avert another PR crisis, the ECB effectively rebranded programmability to conditional payments. The only difference being that the private sector will be the one that implements the digital euro controls, not the ECB. Funnily enough, though, this will be done using tools provided by the ECB. Anyway, since May, there have been multiple digital euro updates. One of the most notable happened in August. The politician who was behind the Markets in Crypto Assets, or MICA, regulation was put in charge of the digital euro team. This is interesting, given that MICA was surprisingly pro-crypto. More on that later. Note, too, that we have the biggest trading fee discounts and up to $40,000 of bonuses on the best crypto exchanges and the biggest discounts on the best hardware wallets, too. These are for a limited time and exclusively for the viewers of this channel, so be sure to check it out with the link at the top of the description. Moving on. Now, the other notable update happened earlier this month, and that's that the ECB has entered the preparation phase for the launch of its digital euro. Not surprisingly, there was lots of pushback about potential privacy and control issues, including from other European regulators, oddly enough. Let's just see how bad these issues are, shall we? As part of the announcement that the ECB had entered the preparation phase, it published a report titled, quote, A Stock Take on the Digital Euro, Summary Report on the Investigation Phase and Outlook on the Next Phase. We'll leave a link to the report in the description if you're interested, by the way. 
So, the report starts with a short summary, which I'll keep short since the same topics are discussed later. I just want to highlight three things that stood out to us. The first is that the authors spend almost half of the summary trying to justify the need for a digital euro. Spoiler alert, it's not needed. As you might have guessed, the summary says that the digital euro will ensure privacy. What the summary doesn't say is that the definition of privacy in the context of CBDCs means not sharing your data with private companies. In other words, if you share your data with the ECB, it's still private. Within their lengthy justification, the authors also state the following, quote, A digital euro would also address risks stemming from geopolitical tensions. This ties into something we speculated about in our previous digital euro update, and that's that Christine is scared about the euro being replaced. The authors don't say anything to that effect here, but they don't really elaborate on this claim either. Regardless, it makes sense. The euro is inherently unstable due to it being used by 19 different countries, each with their own economy and fiscal policies. Total control is the only way to keep things together. Something that the ECB has tacitly admitted in the past, by the way. The second thing that stood out to us in the summary was the ECB not so subtly passing the hot potato on to European politicians. They say that it will be up to the European Commission to ensure that the digital euro has the same properties as cash. For reference, the ECB keeps claiming that the digital euro is like cash. Spoiler alert, it's not. On that note, the third thing that stood out to us was the confirmation that European politicians are currently debating whether to approve the creation of a digital euro. The legislative process began back in June, and it will probably take another year or so to play out. In the interim, the ECB will keep working. Now, the next part of the report is an introduction, which provides a summary of its eight sections. As with the summary, I'll just note what stood out to us. In this case, it's a note by the authors, which says that the terminology in this report may be inconsistent with the terminology in the legislative proposal. The authors note that this terminology will be clarified at a later date. Put differently, the definitions that are being used by the ECB in this report are different from the ones being used by European politicians. Depending on how these definitions are finalized, the digital euro could either be more or less dystopian. If you're enjoying this video so far, by the way, be sure to smash that like button to help others see it. In any case, the first part of the report is about the digital euro, which the authors refer to as a, quote, evolution of money. If you watched our video about how the financial system is rigged, you'll know this claim is incorrect. Gold is money. Currencies, like the euro, be they digital or physical, are not. Anyway, technicalities aside, the authors insist that the digital euro will not replace physical cash or other forms of digital currency. By now, you'll know this is questionable. The ECB had expressed an explicit interest in phasing out all other forms of currency to make way for the digital euro, including monies like gold. The authors also insist that the ECB, quote, would not have access to or store any personal data that would directly identify end users. Now, the key term here is directly identify. It's likely that the ECB would have the ability to indirectly identify end users, be it with the help of commercial banks or otherwise. The authors then go on to admit that there would be limits on digital euro holdings. If you've been keeping up with our digital euro coverage, you'll know the max limit is currently set at 3,000 euros. You'll also know that any holdings above this amount will automatically be converted into regular euros by your bank. This is something the authors allude to when they say, quote, however, they would still be able to make purchases beyond that amount as their digital euro wallet could be linked to their commercial bank account. Linking your bank account to a digital euro, what could possibly go wrong? Anyways, the authors finish off this section by essentially confirming that the digital euro will have no privacy. Quote, It would respect people's privacy without infringing on public policy objectives such as combating money laundering. Logically, meeting these objectives will require surveillance and control. So, it's all an oxymoron. Now, the second part of the report explains what the digital euro will be like for end users. Here we go. 
The authors start by saying that the digital euro will initially only be available to those living in euro countries, i.e. countries that use the euro as their currency. They reveal that the next step will be to expand the availability of the digital euro to other European countries that don't use the euro as their currency. Speaking of which, you should know that all countries that are part of the European Union technically need to adopt the euro at some point. The presence of a digital euro in non-euro countries could be the EU's way of doing what the ECB is scared will happen to the euro, namely flooding these non-euro countries with digital euros. This could set the stage for the weakening and elimination of currencies like the Czech crown and Polish zloty. Food for thought. Anyhow, the authors go on to explain how users will be onboarded. As expected, users would have access to the digital euro at their banks. As we explained in our previous coverage, it would probably start off as just another tab in your account. Eventually, though, it will be the only tab in your account. Regarding limits on your holdings, the authors confirm that there will be limits for financial stability reasons, of course. They explain that the exact limit will be set closer to the launch date, so that €3,000 figure we've seen may be different when the rubber hits the road. What is already set in stone, however, is that businesses will not be allowed to hold any amount of digital euros. Listen to this, quote, Business users would have a zero holding limit, meaning they would not be able to accumulate holdings of digital euro. Oddly enough, the same applies to public authorities. Basically, their digital euro accounts would be a portal of sorts where euros are instantly converted into digital euros and vice versa for whatever purpose, be it payments or otherwise. It's not entirely clear why the ECB made this decision. Perhaps it's because these entities will use their own CBDC systems. For those unfamiliar, there are technically two types of CBDCs. Retail CBDCs, which will be used by plebs like you and me, and wholesale CBDCs, which will be used by select individuals and institutions. It's exactly what it sounds like. One payment system for us, and one payment system for them. If you thought that was crazy though, get this. The authors reveal that the digital euro will have two modes. Online, wherein the ECB can presumably see everything, and offline, wherein the ECB promises a cash-like level of privacy. These offline payments would be peer-to-peer. -peer. Think tapping your phone on another. To make these offline payments possible, the ECB notes that they will leverage, quote, secure elements within phones. This reminds me of something we read in one of the ECB's previous reports, and that's the possibility that specialized hardware would be created and mandated for devices to support this. Newsflash, that would be terrifying. Every EU device would have a government-created chip in it. Naturally, offline digital euros would have limits on holdings, and your offline digital euros would need to be topped up when you're online. Interestingly, quote, Like cash in a lost or stolen wallet, any digital euros stored locally on a lost or stolen device would not be recoverable. Interesting indeed. Anywho, after explaining how linking your digital euro account to your other accounts isn't mandatory in theory but will be necessary in practice, the authors confirm that you will only have one digital euro account even if you have multiple accounts at multiple banks. Financial stability reasons, of course. Then the authors drop a statistic that they're probably ashamed to admit. Quote, In 2022, cash was still the most frequently used payment method at the point of sale in the euro area and was used in 59% of transactions. Note that it was over 70% in 2019. They're really pushing for that cashless society. This relates to the third part of the report, and that's how to make digital euro payments available via payment service providers such as banks and non-banks. Naturally, these entities will be tasked with doing everything, like, for instance, collecting KYC. The ECB will just be in the background settling digital euro transactions. Now, a lot of the information here is pretty straightforward, but there are a few things that stood out to us. First, every user will get a digital euro account number, or DEAN for short. Aliases could be attached to each DEAN, setting the stage for a digital ID which the EU is also in the process of rolling out. 
More about digital IDs in the description. And this pertains to the second thing that stood out to us, and that's that it sounds like you won't be able to delete your Dean once it's been created. If you close your account, the only thing you'll be able to do is transfer that Dean to another commercial bank account. Nothing to see there, I'm sure. And if that wasn't concerning enough, the authors seem to imply that depositing or withdrawing cash to and from your Dean using an ATM may not be an option. For withdrawals, they just say that it can be, quote, assumed that you'll have this ability, whereas for deposits, they say, quote, further analysis is needed. Very reassuring. Now, the third thing that stood out to us is that although businesses will have a digital euro holding limit of zero, the authors note that they will be allowed to hold digital euros in their offline form. They note that the limit on offline digital euro holdings for businesses will be set closer to the launch. The fourth thing that stood out to us was the author's mention of, quote, the digital euro app. This is presumably a reference to the EU's aforementioned digital ID, which will come with a built-in wallet. The promo videos for the digital euro also mention, quote, the digital euro wallet. Case in point, the authors mentioned the EU's digital identity wallet just a few sentences later. The authors then pivot to discussing their so-called digital euro scheme, which was revealed in one of the earlier reports. In short, this requires all businesses to make it possible to pay their employees in digital euros, once again setting the stage for an economy that is totally controlled from the top down. What's funny is that the authors reveal that the ECB will maintain a database of all the deans, but insist that the data will be pseudonymized. This is deceptive wording. It doesn't mean anonymous. Consider that most cryptos are pseudonymous. Almost every transaction can be tracked on a blockchain explorer. The authors also reveal that the ECB will offer payment service providers, quote, a dedicated digital euro central fraud detection and prevention function. If you watched our video about FedNow, you'll know it also contains a fraud detection and prevention function that once again results in currency control. Oddly enough, the authors seem to suggest that the ECB will actually develop its own digital euro app. This seems hard to believe given that the EU's digital ID wallet would serve the same purpose. Then again, I suppose you shouldn't underestimate the tendency for politicians to overspend public money. What's even more odd is that the ECB will make it possible to onboard non-euro currencies in the back end, even though it doesn't plan on offering this function at the outset. It's circumstantial evidence to support the idea that the EU hopes to absorb all non-euro European currencies into the digital euro. The last thing the authors discuss in this part of the report is how a digital euro would fit into the existing payments ecosystem. They spend a lot of time talking about how the digital euro would complement cash and focus on the fact that the offline digital euro would be similar to cash. To their credit, this makes it possible for the ECB to argue that the digital euro is like cash, when in reality, that's only true when it applies to offline payments. This is probably why the community notes pin to Christine's ex post about the digital euro not being equal to cash was subsequently removed. Clever girl. Now, in the fourth part of the report, the authors discuss how the digital euro's use as a means of investment will be limited. They tacitly admit that this is because allowing people to, say, have unlimited digital euro holdings would create the risk of a digital bank run. Can't have that. The authors also hint that there will be transactional limits on digital euro holdings in the name of fraud prevention. They don't say what these limits will be, but they will presumably be in line with existing rules for physical euros. This means transactions of more than a few hundred could raise a red flag. This feature makes the fifth part of the report sound a bit silly because it's about financial inclusion. Nothing says financial inclusion like limiting how much money you can hold and raising a red flag to regulators every time you make a modestly sized transaction. As expected, the authors spend the whole section trying to argue that a bunch of complex digital financial applications with built-in capital controls are the best way to address financial inclusivity. 
To their credit, it will be possible to hold digital euros in card form, which is pretty cool. The authors also reveal that each EU country will have a designated entity that will oversee assisting regular people with the digital euro. The authors suggest post offices. By the way, if you watched our video about the companies that printed all the money, you'll also know that they printed all the stamps too. Big think. Also, we found a spelling mistake. They added an extra G to the word within. Doesn't inspire confidence in the digital euro, to say the least. There will be errors somewhere, and it won't be pretty. Something tells me that these errors will be related to the sixth part of the report, privacy and data protection. The authors pinky promise that the ECB will uphold privacy and data protection for digital euro users with a bunch of footnotes. But they'll also be on the lookout for fraud and tax evasion. In other words, no privacy. And the authors even note that payment service providers may have the ability to share their private data with the ECB. To our understanding, this could actually be mandated due to the EU's recently passed Data Act, which we discussed in another video, link in description. Now, to be fair, the ECB does leave the door open to allowing lower value transactions in digital euros to be totally anonymous, even when online. The authors say this is fundamentally up to EU politicians. But even if they approve this, there will be no way of knowing for sure that privacy is being protected. As the saying in crypto goes, don't trust, verify. And if you can't verify, then don't trust. As it happens, the seventh section is relevant in this regard. It's about the ECB's collaboration with stakeholders. If you've watched any of our videos about the World Economic Forum, you'll know that this means the world's most powerful individuals and institutions. Of course, the ECB is working closely with them. The authors reveal that the ECB conducted a, quote, prototype exercise with these stakeholders some time ago. They made sure that the digital euro will be easy to integrate into the existing system. What's hilarious is that the authors only provide a single sentence about consulting with the general public. And it wasn't even the general public. They worked with small businesses to do the outreach for them. Then in the final part of the report, the authors reveal what comes next. For starters, the ECB will continue to work alongside EU politicians as they discuss the digital euro legislation, which you'll recall was introduced back in June. Notably, they request that EU politicians come to the ECB for any questions. Assuming the digital euro legislation is passed, and it probably will be, then the ECB's governing council will make the final decision to issue a digital euro or not, and they probably will. In the meantime, the ECB's work will enter the preparation phase, which will last for two years from November. For what it's worth, the ECB plans on reaching out to the public during this stage, but I suppose it doesn't guarantee they'll listen. Whatever the case, it looks like the digital euro is on track for a launch in late 2025 or early 2026, consistent with the timeline the ECB has set since the very beginning, almost as if it was already decided. This brings me to the big question, and that's how you can protect yourself from the digital euro. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this only applies if you live in a European country. Over 90% of central banks are planning on rolling out a CBDC of their own. This financial dystopia is coming to your country too, in other words. So, the first way to protect yourself from a CBDC like a digital euro is to try and ensure that related legislation isn't passed, or is at least watered down to the point that it gives power back to the people. At this stage, though, that is going to be very difficult to do for the digital euro, but it could be doable. Recall that the new lead on the digital euro team is the same chap who put together the MICA crypto regulation. If you've watched any of our videos about MICA, you'll know that it appears that the crypto industry, specifically stablecoin issuers, had a significant influence on the regulation. Logically, then, it's possible that this chap is still being lobbied by the same entities. It's therefore possible that the digital euro legislation could be struck down in lieu of a euro stablecoin. Alternatively, it's possible that a euro stablecoin will be adopted 
to the point that a digital euro just isn't needed. This is more plausible than you think because a euro stablecoin would be backed by European government debt. This would allow European governments to subsidize their spending and allow the ECB to keep spreads between their debts in check without stimulus. A euro stablecoin makes the most sense. Anyway, speculation aside, the second way to protect yourself from a CBDC is not to adopt it. This is going to be easier said than done if they start requiring CBDCs for payments for public services and things like taxes. In that case, you'll either have to make an account or find someone who can act as your proxy. Assuming designating someone as your proxy is possible, that might actually be the best way to go. Give someone you know or trust, or pay, the authority to make all digital euro transactions on your behalf. That way, you can just tell them what you need and give them other currency in exchange. Come to think of it, it's possible that there will be new industries that provide these sorts of proxy services. After all, not everyone will have the capacity to use CBDCs. This will necessitate accessibility services, which means that it should be possible to delegate dealing with CBDCs to someone else. Now, the third way to protect yourself from a CBDC is along the lines of the first, and that's to use alternatives wherever you can. Not sure who needs to hear it, but stablecoins aren't that far off from CBDCs. Both are centrally controlled and programmable. The only difference is that stablecoins are privately issued. So, when I say alternatives, I mean truly decentralized cryptocurrencies like BTC. Even then, it's important to remember that all BTC transactions can be tracked. With a bit of luck, the crypto industry will come up with privacy solutions that don't result in regulatory crackdowns. We are optimistic about this. And if all else fails, there's always physical cash and gold. The problem is that the former may not last for long, and governments will likely try to seize the latter. As we've seen in countries like Nigeria, however, if there's enough civil disobedience and alternative networks, the government will be powerless. At the end of the day, what gives money its power is its network effect. Last I checked, there's more of us than there are of them. That means that we can create payment networks that are larger and more powerful than CBDCs. This is what they're afraid of, and they will work hard to prevent it. But in the end, the people will prevail. We always do, eventually. And that's all for today's video. If you found it informative, let us know by hitting that like button. If you want to stay informed, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you want to help inform others, be sure to share this video with any friends and family who you think would actually watch it. That's always the hard part, isn't it? Also, remember that the Coin Bureau Deals page has up to $40,000 of bonuses on the best crypto exchanges and the biggest discounts on the best hardware wallets. The link is down in the description if you missed it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.